Hello everyone. Welcome to Watershed Moments, the video trilogy series. My name is David McKenzie. I am a member of the Watershed Moments team. Including our speakers, the team consists of 15 people representing 11 organizations. Producing the trilogy series has involved an amazing collaboration on the part of everyone. My role in this collaborative effort has been as director, videographer, and editor. We begin the program today with the first video in the series. And at the end of the video, we will go live with a question and answer period. During the video broadcast, email your questions at this address. The email link is below the video viewer on the water bucket page you've been sent to attend this presentation. Again, that's questions at watersustainabilitybc, all one word, dot ca. We will accept questions throughout the broadcast until the final 10 minutes or so. That will be the point at which the presentation team members summarize their takeaway messages. YouTube gives you the option of pausing the video, so if necessary, you can exit the event without missing any portions of it. Now, as they say, let's get on with the show. Hi, I'm Paul Chapman, the Executive Director of the Nanaimo and Area Land Trust and the Chair of the Vancouver Island Water Stewardship Symposia Series. And I'm Kim Stevens, Executive Director, Partnership for Water Sustainability in British Columbia. And the Symposia Series is a program under the umbrella of the Georgia Basin Interregional Education Initiative. Thank you for joining us for the first module in Watershed Moments, the Video Trilogy Series. We are speaking to you today from the territory of the Snanaymuk people. The COVID pandemic is the reason for this virtual presentation of the third annual Vancouver Island Symposium on Water Stewardship in a Changing Climate. The unifying theme for the video trilogy is actionable visions for reconnecting hydrology and ecology in altered landscapes. Kim, would you please explain what we mean by reconnecting hydrology and ecology? Sure, Paul. I will start by connecting the dots between reconciliation with First Nations and reconciliation with the water cycle. We need a new culture of water, and in the spirit of reconciliation, wouldn't it be great if water managers would interweave Indigenous cultural knowledge and Western science? We can learn from First Nations and their connection to the land. They get it that hydrology and ecology are bound together as a system, but we treat them as separate silos. Through our actions on the land, we have disconnected hydrology and ecology in the built environment, and this magnifies the consequences of floods and droughts. Interweaving is about bringing worlds together and people too. It is a whole system way of thinking and doing. As a society, we view water as a commodity. We turn on the tap, we flush the toilet, we drain the land. We communicate using numbers we have forgotten that there's a spiritual side to water. It sounds like you're describing the work of Michael Blackstock, author of Blue Ecology. Absolutely, Paul, because adapting to a changing climate requires a fundamental shift in how all of us view land and water. Michael Blackstock defines interweaving as blending the best threads of indigenous knowledge and western science to lay a new foundation. His message is, make water first decisions respect the water cycle. Embracing an indigenous knowledge will help us re reconnect land and water and hydrology and ecology too. Interweaving is a long-term vision. The immediate priority of this symposia series is to showcase the power of collaboration among the stewardship and local government sectors to improve where we live. In this first module, five women representing four regional districts on Vancouver Island speak to some of the shared and unique triumphs and challenges of the respective water stewardship initiatives. From the stewardship sector point of view, there are opportunities to align efforts for Boots in the Creek with central coordination and a conduit to senior government expertise and resources. 
the connections and collaboration work to reconnect hydrology with ecology. Our watersheds are the front lines of our climate change adaptation. We need to put some urgency into our climate change emergency. Welcome. My name is Richard Bose. I'm here in Hunter Park in the District of North Vancouver alongside the bank of Hastings Creek. I'm very proud and happy to share this place with you as it's a place that I've grown up and I've worked in for my entire life. As moderator for this virtual watershed series, you are going to determine your own course of success. The series was designed to produce technical information, give you background on some of the innovative collaboration happening around the district, and talk about some of the new and emerging trends in natural assets and community services municipalities provide. It's up to you to take whatever resonates with you from this series and choose what you want to do with it. An actionable vision for land and water is driven by leadership that mobilizes people and partnerships, a commitment to ongoing learning and innovation, and so importantly, a budget to back it all up. I'm Julie Pisani, and I'm a water woman. Here we are on the beautiful banks of the Englishman River, one of the iconic rivers in the regional district of Nanaimo. I've been working with the Regional District of Nanaimo since 2011, and I'm the program coordinator for the Drinking Water and Watershed Protection Program. My passion is around communication and the environment. I think it's really important to use stories and personal connection to reach out to different groups and really understand what compels people to act in an environmentally sustainable way. And I think water is uniquely an element that brings people together. What I really like about what I do with the Regional District of Nanaimo's Drinking Water and Watershed Protection Program is the people I meet and the places we get to work towards protecting, restoring, and maintaining. So when I see people's passion, whether it's streamkeeper groups, you know, out restoring creeks, whether it's farmers who are really passionate about their crops and their livelihood, whether it's students that we take up to the dam to see where their drinking water comes from and their eyes light up at the, at the infrastructure and the, and the natural beauty uh, in front of them. All of these things really drive me. It's the people and the places. And I think if we can combine the science, the education, and bring that into our planning and our policy, then we've got a really great kind of recipe for water sustainability and land management within the region. So what does success look like when we're talking about water sustainability? To me, it's not necessarily an end arrival point where you get to and you kind of dust off your hands and say, we're done. It's actually more of an ongoing process. So partially it's an ethic of how we relate to the land, to the water, to each other. And this is something that's really important when we look at nature as not as something separate to us, but something that's integral to our well-being. And if we look at it from a lens of water, you know, having the ecological function of the forest, of the soil, the vegetation, natural features, to absorb that rainfall and mitigate against climate impacts and to live in balance with that, I think that is what we're striving for and always engaged in a process to achieve. I'm Jody Watson, coming to you from Victoria, British Columbia. I'm here alongside Boker Creek, which is one of our urban creeks. Two thirds of the creek is in pipes and 56% of the land base is impervious. We're going to be talking, you're going to learn a lot about Boker Creek uh, throughout this conference. But in the meantime, come on, I want to show you the classroom, the Creekside classroom. Let's go. I work with the Capital Regional District as the Supervisor of Environmental Planning and Initiatives. We coordinate several watershed initiatives where we work with local governments, community, and other stakeholders on improving the hydrological function of our watersheds. I think what drives me to do the work that I do is the fact that I was a free-range child growing up. I grew up in a small town in Saskatchewan. Uh, we, my playground was the creek 
or the, the slough. And that's where I experienced biology. That's where I experienced nature, whether it was catching frogs or looking at tadpoles or catching fish or fireflies. Catching fireflies was amazing. And I grew up, I grew up in that environment. And then when I moved to the city, I was very much disconnected from that environment. You couldn't touch the creeks, you couldn't get into the water because they were channelized or they had fences around them. One of the things that I hope to get out of this conference is inspiration. When I look at the watersheds that we are dealing with here in the capital region, many of them are highly degraded. Uh, they've lost their hydrological function. Oftentimes, they don't even have a riparian. Uh, so when I hear from the communities North Island, where they are dealing with very natural systems and they're, they're working to protect them and maintain them in the natural state, that is what I find inspirational, is, is to be able to uh, see how far we can get here in the region to bring back nature into our urban environment so that they function more like those beautiful natural watersheds that we see in the North Island. Hi, I'm Kate Miller and we're sitting here uh, next to the Cowichan River. It's my backyard, and that is all of our backyards. I'm the manager of environmental services for the Cowichan Valley Regional District. I'm a registered planner, but work as a plan engineer and uh, look at the lens of watersheds, the region and our communities in terms of climate change and water. I moved here 36 years ago and fell in love with the place instantly. It's beautiful. It feeds you. The community feeds you. The people here, the environment, the watersheds, all different while being the same. What drives me is that beauty, wanting to protect that beauty for others to come after us. We have to do it carefully. And it drives me in terms of the, the welcoming of the new people to make sure that they understand it and they take care of it as well. I love these conferences. I, I love that we have a, a regular opportunity to come together and, and share ideas and tools and build new relationships. Um, but a lot of the time we're, we're talking about the same things and we're bringing new folks in and we're, we're welcoming them, we're, we're inviting them into this process. What I'd really like to see out of this kind of whole new process that we're undertaking at this point through a digital uh, conference is to also start to explore some of the harder challenges uh, beyond simple stewardship tools and mechanisms um, and it's something that we have between the the group up here talking about the work that we do and collaboration but really hoping that the participants of the conference in the digital world can start to collaborate together as well, to build those synergies, to make a difference in their own communities and their own watersheds, and start to reach out in the same way that we have and to create alliances across watersheds. And this is my backyard. Isn't it amazing? I'm Derry Monteith, here on the beautiful shores of Comox Lake. I manage wastewater and rainwater planning initiatives in the Comox Valley Regional District electoral areas. Uh, through my role, I work together with our community and our First Nations and government partners to better understand and address uh, challenges with flooding, with water quality and with drought in our rural communities. Hi, I'm Zoe norcross New, and I live in Courtney. I'm an engineering analyst at the Comox Valley Regional District, and in the last few years, uh, following the adoption of the Comox Lake Watershed Protection Plan, my focus has shifted to implementation, overseeing implementation of the Watershed Protection Plan. 
So a lot of my daily activities involve um, establishing and looking after water quality monitoring equipment and gathering data and collecting samples, water samples uh, in the watershed. But on the other end of the spectrum, I'm also doing a lot of work with the community and with our partners, looking at other aspects of watershed protection, uh, such as community outreach and education. I, I think we're all noticing change and increasing pressures in our watersheds from climate change, from governance challenges, and from quickly developing communities. And um, we see opportunities like this where we can share and we can learn from our neighboring regional districts and from our communities as really important opportunities to progress some of our own planning work. Mm -hmm. Definitely. We, up in here in the Comox Valley Regional District, were um, uh, a, a lot younger in our process for watershed protection uh, planning and implementation. And so this is an excellent opportunity for us to get together with our colleagues uh, that do similar work in the other regional districts to the south of us and learn from them about how they've gone about uh, resourcing their programs and uh, implementing their programs as well. So for us, uh, this is an excellent opportunity um, to uh, further develop those relationships and learn from other people's experiences that in similar environments to our own. What happens on the land matters. In our lead-off module, a dynamic team of five women provide their insider insights into an array of water-centric initiatives and programs underway in four Vancouver Island regional districts. In each region, water management initiatives are now into a second decade and ramping up. Sharing and learning from each other helps these program managers and doers adapt concepts and approaches into the local context. The programs they lead are foundation pieces for restoring the water balance in altered landscapes. Are you aware of the program scope, scale, and interplay? Do you wonder whether how each is making a difference and what the challenges they face are? When you think about BC's new climate reality, do you wonder what regional governments can realistically do and achieve in respond to these challenges. An appropriate analogy is building a bridge across a river. The time to construct the foundation can seem like an eternity. But then, very quickly, the bridge superstructure takes shape and actions happen and change is evident. An actionable vision is driven by the line items that comprise each local government's annual budget, the four C's, communication, cooperation, coordination, and collaboration are all essential ingredients. Would it have occurred to you that an actionable vision for land and water is driven by leadership that mobilizes people and partnerships, a commitment to ongoing learning and innovation, and especially a budget to back it all up. Given the current climate trends associated with eastern Vancouver Island, water is going to be one of the most important and primary issues going forward. How do we move forward and make the hard decisions needed with our eyes wide open? What I'd like to do now is start the conversation and hear from some of the panel around what are some of the important and emerging trends associated with climate change in their district. Sure, Richard, that's a good place to start. So when we look at the regional district of Nanaimo, you know, we look at water in terms of community drinking water supply, but also the environmental value of water within our communities. And thinking about climate change and how that's impacting water in the regional district, we can look at extremes of drought on one side of things, and then flooding and intense rainfall on the other side of things. And sort of the key thing to better understand these emerging trends and the dynamic of having uncertainty, uh, for us it starts with collecting data, 
collecting information and having science so that we can go in, as you say, with our eyes wide open when we have to start making some decisions around servicing and around protecting water resources locally. Uh, Kate, I know in the Cowichan Valley, a lot of the issues around climate change are around how it might affect the supply and quantity of water available. Maybe talk a little bit about that. Sure. Um, similar to Julie's comment around science-based planning and strategies, we've been uh, over, I would say, the last 25 years looking at some of the, the major issues on the Cowichan system. So it's not a, just about emerging future trends, but really exposing some of the existing trends that had been masked in other ways. So uh, for us, the, the issue is both surface and groundwater. Uh, the surface water is obviously much more visible to the community. They can see that uh, fish can't make it up into the system. They see the creeks drying, those sorts of things. Uh, for us, the, the challenge is also communicating that the, the limited resources in groundwater along the coastal zone is in fact uh, much more concerning than the surface conditions. They're, they're kind of, they showcase each other and so for our region, we've, we've looked at kind of a science-based approach to climate projections uh, at an 800 kind of uh, meter scale so that we can, we can do key assessments, uh, but also starting to look at the reality of where major infrastructure is going to be required. Do we need to raise the weir? Uh, do we need to supply water to communities where there is a limited opportunity now and certainly going into the future. In the Capital Regional District, our reality is a little bit different. We are uh, largely urbanized in our region, so our issues are around how do we manage all of the rainfall um, that is going to be falling in the region when we know our infrastructure is, uh, will be undersized. So we're taking uh, more of an integrated watershed management approach where we're trying to essentially change the ethic of how we, de how we develop our land. Um, in terms of the climate reality, uh, working with Cowichan um, as well as the PCIX, the Pacific Climate Impacts Consortium, uh, we worked on the downscaled climate projections. We've also uh, done tsunami and uh, sea level rise mapping that will be used as an input um, for planning for all of the 13 municipal governments that are in that region. In 2019, the CRD board declared a climate emergency, uh, so, and they've got some very specific strategic priorities around climate, so now as staff, we are working on business cases and work plans to implement those priorities for the board. So I know in, uh, in my uh, local jurisdiction in North Vancouver, uh, climate change has forced us into looking at how we might envision different risk assessments. I was reading some of the background where people, some of the, the group had talked about the need for these structured risk assessments. Uh, let's t I want to talk a little bit about that and how climate change might be causing new risk assessments in areas where we didn't previously think they were needed or changing the way we have done traditional risk assessments. Anyone can comment about that? I, I can speak a little bit to that, Richard. Uh, one of the things that we've been looking at, certainly out of the, the, the fallout of the, the PICS uh, projections, is to ask the question, now what, so what? So we know we're moving from a snow-dominated system to a rain-dominated system. What exactly does that mean? Uh, so we've uh, been going through our region and updating all of our flood maps with the new climate reality norms. Uh, we're also looking at major uh, slope stability issues. So we're going to start to see mass wasting or um, torrent flow basically affecting a lot of the communities that have developed at the toe of our slopes. Uh, and it's, it's raised some really interesting questions for us from a land use planning perspective around risk tolerance and whether or not we continue to approve developments in areas where perhaps they're not at risk now. The hazard hasn't really become or come to the forefront now, 
but it will very soon given the projections. So for us, it's the, the reality of we know where we're going as a general trajectory, but it's the range of variability and trying to, to balance those two things as it relates to land use and approvals of development and ultimately making sure that our communities are safe. Omox Valley Regional District, uh, most of our um, drinking water supply comes from one single watershed, the Comox Lake watershed. And so um, a few years ago we had the Pacific Climate Impacts Consortium uh, do some modeling and projections to look at how that would affect our water supply and how that, uh, how the model, the forecast models um, for future climate scenarios um, could affect our, the water availability in the summer. And um, as Kate was mentioning, um, shifting from a snow rain regime, it looks like we will be transitioning to a rain rain regime, which um, without that winter storage of snow, um, water in the form of snow and melting uh, ice from glaciers, um, it's really gonna change the, the, the pattern of, of how water is released into the uh, watershed over the course of the year. So we will have a lot more water coming in, uh, especially uh, following big rainstorms in the wintertime. And without the storage, um, it's going to really uh, shift the way the curve um, of the water storage releasing into the watershed. Um, uh, it's it's going to shift earlier in the year, and so uh, the summertime is, is likely to, to present some challenges. Um, so we also, following up on that, we use that data then to look at uh, what the risk was to uh, the Puntledge River fisheries habitats because we're also currently building a new water treatment plant, and we wanted to ensure that with uh, the, the projected water withdrawals from Comox Lake, which we will have with the new treatment plant, that there will still be enough water in the Pontledge River for the fish. And so far, um, it, it looks like that will be fine, that, um, that there will be enough water. But it's one thing to do modeling, and it's another thing to um, uh, collect the actual data on the ground that we can use to actually measure those changes and how they actually are occurring. And from that, we can strengthen the models and um, strengthen our projections as well. So we've um, made a pretty significant effort in the last few years to install um, high elevation weather stations, monitoring snowpack, um, and also um, on the ground monitoring. We have uh, new flow gauges um, installed so that we can actually measure the amount of water coming into the watershed, coming into Comox Lake, and um, how, how the, the different, the rainstorms that we're receiving are changing how the water patterns are flowing into the lake. Because I think we can, most of us can agree that um, there, there is no normal weather system um, coming through any year now. It's uh, every year is different. So yeah, so it's important to measure those changes. So I'd like to hear again from the Comox Valley a little bit because my understanding is some of your watershed protection programs are, are comparatively newer compared to some of the work in the other regional districts. Do you think that given how much more we know about climate change than even 10 years ago, is that advent advantageous for you, do you think, that you're getting going and you now you know what's ahead of you? Or do you think that you, you, know, you might have started doing things differently as opposed to some of these other places where they might actually have to be changing existing programs on the fly now because of climate change? I think um, outside of the, the, the water system that's fed by the, the Comox Lake watershed, we have um, a lot of concern in some of our rural communities about uh, surface water and groundwater availability. We don't have a lot of information and data on, on availability, or especially groundwater availability at this time. And so we're really looking to some of our regional partners like the RDN to see how they're able to work with the stewardship sector and, um, and local First Nations to really kind of build a program that can, can give us the data to, to manage water and to adapt better in the future. Yeah, I think that's a, a good point you bring up, Gary, in terms of just the diversity of issues when it comes to water. And even within a single region, you know, when you look at the aquifers and the watersheds, they're responding differently to climate change. Even though climate change is affecting Vancouver Island as a whole, you know, you can take the data that you're collecting and look at it on uh, a watershed scale and an aquifer scale and even a community-based scale. So 
For an example, the city of Nanaimo has a really robust drinking water supply system, large storage reservoirs in the upper Nanaimo River watershed. And in that way, you know, they've built more resilience to climate change. They have storage uh, for the rains that do come in the wintertime and the snow melt that does come, although, as Zoe mentioned, that accumulation is lessening. Um, so resilience is really high in terms of that system. But then, as, as Derry mentioned, you know, there's, there's loads of other drinking water systems, even in the rural areas, and they're re re relying on groundwater. And in terms of groundwater, it's more complex. As Kate said earlier, you know, surface water, we can see our rivers, we can see our lakes visually above ground. But below ground, you know, it's something that we do need to collect more information on to understand the dynamics of how water is infiltrating into our water tables, into our aquifers. And, you know, it, it varies. We have bedrock aquifers in the region that are actually proving to be not as resilient to, to drought conditions, having lower yields and more challenges. Whereas some uh, sands and gravel aquifers that, that are proving to be resilient and having large storage capacities to buffer some drought conditions. So I think when we're looking at climate change and the response on the ground, we do have to be nimble to say, let's look at context specific data and how we can respond to that in our varying communities. And it's not a one size fits all response. Mm -hmm. I think there's another piece to that too, is that you know the difference for Jody, for example, who lives in a very urbanized area and for the, for the vast majority of us that live in, in larger, more rural or resource areas, is that the vast majority of our communities have private wells. And so how do we look at protecting those private assets and infrastructure? And I think that there is, this is a, a really critical period of time where we're starting to look at modernized uh, official community plans. Do we make uh, real decisions around what carrying capacity do our communities need with regards to water? Do we invest in infrastructure like Nanaimo that provides water to a group of folks uh, as opposed to being more dispersed across the landscape? And so um, it's, it's very different and there will have to be different tools uh, mm -hmm. in the toolbox based on the physical characteristics of the watersheds. And I want to pick up on another comment Derry said, which is around involving the stewardship sector and involving the community in part of the data collection. So, you know, one example in the regional district of Nanaimo is our volunteer observation well monitoring program, uh, where we see there are monitoring wells that the province is running, but there are gaps. They can't be everywhere all at once. The province is at the 50,000 foot view. We're on the ground within the local area within the region. And there's people who have wells and they're, they're able to volunteer those for some of our monitoring initiatives. So I think, you know, that's something that we can share, sort of that combination of, you know, relying on provincial monitoring, but also looking locally to say, how can we fill gaps in those monitoring networks that exist and work with volunteers, work with the community, have standards, you know, so the data is collected in a way that can be used meaningfully. Um, but I think, you know, being engaged with the folks on the ground is a really important way forward. Again, climate change. The Boker Creek plan is a 100-year vision, right? So how are you even able to get to that 100-year vision without looking at things not narrow focus, but wide open, right? So it, it's interesting. Um, we initially developed a watershed management plan uh, for the Boker Creek, which was a very high-level uh, visioning document. But development actually happens on a site-by-site -site basis. So when development was occurring, the planners weren't able to um, see how that parcel of property fit into the larger vision. So we developed uh, a hundred year plan called the Boker Creek Blueprint, where we brought together all of the engineering, the social aspects, uh, and the environmental aspects of the watershed and developed a plan to, to do that watershed. Uh, there were many, many, many watershed-wide and reach-specific actions within that plan. So one of the things that we did was prioritize uh, 10 top key actions that we wanted to achieve in the first five to 10 years. And that has really helped us to kind of get the momentum going. Within that document, uh, we did have some climate projections, uh, early, early climate projections, because that's now uh, 10, 15 year old document. Um, 
And so all of the engineering solutions that are provided within the blueprint are a climate adapted solution. So it's looking at the increased rainfall that we expect to get. So eyes wide open, I think, really means adaptive management, where we have to plan something, we then go and do it, we figure out is that actually working by monitoring it, and then we come back and we replan. If it, if it doesn't, doesn't work, then we have to adjust and figure out which way we're going to go. So that's one of the, the things with the Boker Creek Blueprint is it's, it's opportunistic and it's, it gives us the ability to come back and revisit it now that we have new information or there's new situations we can revisit that and um, we'll be coming out with a, a new blueprint at some point in time that updates some of the actions that we need to take so that we can further advance ourselves to achieve the 100 year vision. Collaboration at any scale, whether it's regionally, city to city, neighbor to neighbor, or even person to person is becoming so important in these kinds of watershed programs that you're all leading. So I think it's important that we take the time to really discuss what collaboration has meant to some of the groups around the table, the benefits, the problems you're solving with collaboration. So uh, in the Comox Valley Regional District, uh, a few years ago when we were tasked with uh, developing a watershed protection plan, uh, I think there was uh, some concern due to historical uh, tensions, or per perhaps it was just perceived tensions, um, among different stakeholder groups. And, and uh, you know, with the goal of trying to get everybody on board, uh, trying to figure out what was the best approach for that. So um, we began with um, uh, a Creeks and Communities workshop, and, and the goal of that workshop was to give everybody a common language and so that all the stakeholders um, would be speaking about the resources uh, in the same words, using the same words and with the same ideas and, and with the same understandings of how the processes um, and functions uh, need to come together for healthy uh, streams and healthy wetlands and watersheds. So that turned out to be a really effective way uh, to bring together all the stakeholders and um, have an educational experience together. And um, set, it set a really good uh, foundation for um, our watershed advisory group, which then brought together um, all the local uh, groups that were either in, um, private landowners or managers or community partners who had an interest um, in the watershed management process. Um, and so uh, when we first came to the table, uh, we had already been through this, this, this outdoor educational experience together. And um, what we quickly came to realize that even though everybody was from very diverse backgrounds and had very diverse interests, um, that it, ultimately we all want the same thing. And everybody wants clean water and everybody wants to protect the water source, um, even though we're sort of approaching it from different angles. And so um, that aspect of um, coming together and, and you know, really focusing on what it is that we want um, it was, was a great way to, um, to get everybody on the same page and uh, to develop an underlying sense of, of, of respect and trust between everybody so that when we started digging into the difficult conversations and doing um, risk analysis and uh, risk rankings uh, for, for what the watershed was facing, then um, even when we were having difficult discussions, they were done um, uh, in a respectful way. And ultimately, the, the outcome from that was because it was such a diverse group of stakeholders that came together to, uh, to address this challenge, uh, there is a great deal of community buy-in and support for this plan because uh, of the recognition of the, the thoroughness of the community process and, and that everybody um, involved uh, supported the, the process and was involved in uh, supporting the development of the Watershed Protection Plan. Great. So I guess getting separate interest groups who maybe weren't heard or didn't feel they were getting heard was a way to bring those common interests together. Uh, similar examples or ideas? Well, in the Capital Regional District, we sometimes we work on a specific watershed, such as the Boca Creek uh, watershed. So through that initiative, similarly, we brought together all of the stakeholders, the three municipalities and six community associations are represented on our steering committee. Um, and, and everything that we do is collaborative. 
One of the big studies that we've just recently finished is a daylighting feasibility study. So within this watershed, two-thirds of the creek is actually in pipe, and there's 35,000 people that live in the watershed. So it's very developed. We, have, we got together uh, the planning and engineering and parks departments of all three municipalities. Uh, we had a consultant-led process, and we really put pencils to paper, literally, and tried to figure out what's the route that we can actually protect here so that we can daylight this creek over the next 50 years. Um, so it has been, a, it, the end result is we now have a study that we'll be taking forward to the municipal councils for endorsement, uh, where over 95% of the creek, we feel we will be able to daylight in the future with long-term planning. Um, I think the study is really, really timely because at this point, that whole watershed is ripe for redevelopment. So all the housing stock and the business uh, community is all being redeveloped. So having a daylighting feasibility um, corridor defined will allow the planners and engineers as they're rebuilding out this watershed, it will allow them to designate areas uh, so that we can daylight the creek in the future. And that only could happen through a collaborative process. It was really important to bring all three disciplines within the municipalities together to have those conversations and the organic um, innovative solutions that we ended up with as a result was just brilliant. So we're really excited to be taking that forward to council uh, in the near future and, and hopefully get endorsement and then we'll update the blueprint uh, with some of those new actions. That's really mm -hmm. exciting, Jody. Uh, I think it's a good example that shows more broadly how water and managing water and land is, uh, is a great place to convene. It's, uh, it's naturally a collaborative topic because water flows across jurisdictional boundaries. So in the CRD, you're talking about working with the various municipalities, you know, in our context, in the regional districts, working with municipalities, but also working with private managed forest landowners, working with community level, and working with senior government. Uh, all of those elements coming together, I think, you know, that's just the nature of water. We can't constrain it into a box of it's just this one jurisdiction. So. I think interregionally, what we've been able to do as a group is, is kind of hear from each other on you know, what's going on in CRD, what's working well in sort of that developed urban context. Um, and then we can talk to other regional districts and say, you know, similar issues with private managed forest land and upper watersheds. And collaboration has been the key, actually, if I speak to our experience in regional district of Nanaimo, is building that trust and relationships with, with the forestry sector. Um, and a, a really good inroad for that was education. So partnering on watershed tours and school field trips to go up into the upper watersheds, you know, take a look around, see the dams and the forestry operations. And it's actually by riding the bus into the upper watersheds with the foresters, with the group of school kids, that we're able to build trust, um, you know, across kind of industry and local government. And that, like was said earlier, when it comes to tougher conversations that have to happen around policy and around management, you're starting from a place of, hey, we already have a relationship, we know each other, and we can start to converge on some, some common and shared values around protecting water. I think for our region in the Cowichan, it's very similar to that in many ways. Um, for us, it's, it's been a lot about resourcing and the the real challenge that we face as a local government not having the resources uh, to really do what we'd like to do in terms of showcasing leadership and uh, having an opportunity to work really closely with our community. We've got 17 watershed groups within our region and so a lot of the, the time and energy that we've spent has really been about uh, helping to build capacity at a community level, the, the circles of influence, if, if you will, particularly if you look back and you say many of those small stewardship groups relied on grant funding, which dried up about 10 years ago. And so can we create an opportunity for them to come together? Can we support that so they can share resources, share information, share technical capacity, be uh, sources for each other, and not necessarily look at local government as the one and only solution. 
uh, but it also allows us to work with them much more strongly and ta uh, tactically in terms of who's got resources, who's got skills, who actually knows that watershed and can those skills be transferred, not carbon copied, but transferred elsewhere. And so this notion of intra-regional partnerships as well as an incredible ability to work with, with my other partners to say, who's, who's leading, who's done the hard work? And can we import some of that into our thinking? So, yeah. so we heard, sorry, we heard from uh, Zoe talk about how collaboration helped sh form some of your shared interests and visions. Gary, talk a little bit about how important you see collaboration looking forward. What are some of the partnerships uh, that you see being important to getting your work done? And how might collaboration and these new partnerships come about? Yeah, well, I guess building on what Kate said, um, interregional collaboration is, is essential to, um, to water management as a whole. Um, in 2013, we developed a rainwater management strategy for our rural areas. And in trying to progress some of the action items that were identified in that strategy, what we're really learning is, um, like Julie said, you know, creeks cross jurisdictional boundaries really an integrated watershed-based approach is essential to rainwater management and so it's it's so important that we're able to, to collaborate and work together with our municipal partners and the province to to ensure that we're managing water and taking the steps towards that water balanced approach in our land alterations. Yeah, cause one thing it makes me think of too is that water itself is collaborating with itself. So groundwater <laughs> is supporting streams to flow. Right? And I think when we're managing water, we need to think not only collaboratively about the organizations and the partners we're working with, but what can water itself teach us about how to manage it. And so I think from a technical level, we've spent some time really understanding that groundwater is essential to stream flow. Uh, and recharging groundwater is actually part of mitigating flooding. So, you know, if we can have our vegetation and our soils intact, so the rainfall can actually soak into the ground, reach the groundwater table and move underground to actually not only support drinking water systems that rely on groundwater, but support stream systems that rely on groundwater as well. And that's where I think there's an overlap between sort of the rainwater management aspects that Jody and Derry have spoken to, and then some of the water supply and community drinking water sources that, that others have spoken to as well. So water crosses all, all of those boundaries, which I find mm -hmm. fascinating. Mm -hmm. I think it allows us to look at some bigger policy issues too, right? So, you know, flood management, we have a watershed, but within our region, we've got four different governments within the floodplain, all of them managing flooding completely differently, and in fact, uh, causing additional flooding in adjacent jurisdictions. So this, the time it takes and the effort it takes to recreate functional partnerships that have ultimate goals for the community um, are time consuming. And I, I also look at the work that Derry's doing around rainwater management and some of the major policy changes, you know, we would like to see with MOTI and subdivision servicing and kind of provincial policy, it's going to take all of us to try to push that forward to say, how do we look at uh, revitalized provincial policy and guidance documents? So. So we've talked a bit about uh, the successes in engaging, collaborating with our community, the stakeholders, the interest groups. Uh, I'm, we're going to talk about in one of the future modules from the subject matter ex experts the importance of uh, collaboration in amongst our subject matter experts, right? I think now more than ever we're needing the scientists that didn't traditionally collaborate too much or too well are needing to get together to make talk about what they're finding, what they're seeing. So uh, Jody, I can't imagine a more pressing need in terms of this highly urban environment where we're going to need multiple collaborative efforts on behalf of the experts. You talked briefly before, but what is, how, how does collaboration involving the science uh, mean to you and what are some of your thoughts about that? 
even even with the downscaled climate projections that we did, uh, that was a local government, actually two local governments, because we were working as well with the Cowichan Valley Regional District, working with the scientists at the Pacific Climate Impacts Consortium. Um, and some of the documents that were produced from that took the science but actually put it into much more layman terms so that we all had a common language that we could speak uh, to around what is going to be happening with our changing climate. Um, science is, is key. We, do, we also have a lot of uh, community groups and individuals who participate in uh, citizen science through uh, a great example actually is the, um, we did a restoration through Oak Bay High School and as part of that project we had a design charrette with, that involved students and teachers and the municipality and uh, they decided that they really wanted an outdoor classroom. So we built an outdoor classroom into the design of the creek and now what happens is we also worked with the school on curriculum around flow and water quality and vegetation monitoring. So now the, there's a teacher champion at that school and all of his science classes are going through and they, they do vegetation monitoring, water quality monitoring and look at a lot of the flow data. Um, so I, and, and now the community has also gotten involved in mentoring the students. So we've got um, a, a few volunteers who uh, are all about fish and so now they're going down and mentoring the students and working with the teachers and teaching them all about what more do we need to do to this section of the creek that's been restored so we can actually get fish back here. So it all comes together. Um, water brings everything together as Julie was saying and, and I, think, um, I think with a changing climate we're just going to have to do that a little bit faster. Maybe just to pick up on that, we live on Vancouver Island. It's stunningly beautiful. Uh, we are incredibly privileged to live here. And we have a lot of folks who are retiring here. Uh, we've got amazing capacity at the community level in terms of professionals who can mm. actually add to our program. It's, it's our role to create a structure, to, to create a process, uh, but if we open the doors and we let the community partner with us, uh, not just on you know data collection, but actually utilizing the data and make it as open source as possible, uh, it's really amazing what we're starting to see come out of that process. So it's a it's kind of a breaking down of the the silos within our organization, but also between ourselves and the community itself. That's exciting. That's a great example and idea. It's kind of like taking a, a committee of council to a more informal but much more practical level, mm -hmm. leveraging the, the scientists out in the community, community, asking them to get involved. Uh, great, great stuff. Anyone, uh, any more comments to close up? One thing I just want to add is I think, you know, we've talked a lot about stakeholders and, you know, community engagement, working interdepartmentally, working across levels of government. But I think looking forward, um, you know, we have to really be mindful of also working with rights holders and First Nations as, you know, the relationship of First Nations to land and water is unique and it's significant. But I just want to plant the seed for, you know, future conversations about land and water management and how that's very much related to reconciliation with First Nations. And as local government, mm -hmm. you know, we're gonna be here and we're neighbors with, regional, with uh, First Nations in the region. And uh, just as something to, to frame collaboration and elevate collaboration uh, moving forward, that's something to continue to consider. I think that's a, that's a really good point. Uh, that was another thing that uh, the Capital Regional District has has really, I think, made some really good progress on. Uh, we have some very specific strategic priorities around uh, working with First Nations, and one specific one is to develop an ecological assets management plan for the region that incorporates First Nations values. So that's, a, that's going to be a massive collaboration project amongst 13 municipalities, nine First Nations, the region, the province, and 50 odd some uh, community and environmental groups uh, that will be very interested in, in that type of work. So I, I, I agree, I think that that's going to be um, a key part of all of us 
developing a, a new land ethic with a First Nations yeah. lens. We've talked about climate change, the emerging new realities we're all facing. Uh, we talked a lot about collaboration across all manners and sectors. So now we're going to spend a bit of time talking about some of our visions or actionable visions and projects that have come out of the climate change reality and the collaboration. And maybe what we can do is, is talk about the Comox Valley and some of these visions and, and projects that you see moving forward for yourselves. Sure, yeah, thanks. Um, we, I, I was uh, talking earlier about the Watershed Protection Plan, which we, um, which we developed. And one of the items that came up as, uh, with fairly strong uh, importance in that process was to develop a uh, public education um, a plan for the community not just for residents, but for visitors as well. And so because that had a high priority in the Watershed Protection Plan, uh, we were able to um, allocate resources from our um, water service subfunction, the Watershed Protection subfunction. And uh, we initiated a program that is called Connected by Water. And um, the goal of this program is to develop, de develop capacity, community, and connection um, in support of watershed protection and water conservation. So what this, um, what we have been working on, because the, the thing is that with um, the Comox Lake watershed is, is mostly privately owned land. Um, uh, uh, it's about two thirds is private managed forest lands and um, the remaining part actually is um, mostly BC parks. And so um, one of the things that uh, we, we can do is to help manage uh, on the demand side, but also on the resource protection side and just raising awareness of when people are spending time recreating in the resource. Because unlike some watersheds uh, that are closed off to the public, the Comox Lake um, watershed, uh, the private lands are, are often open to the public uh, on weekends, but also the, the water, the lake itself, is open to recreation. So in terms of, of protecting the watershed, we need to ensure that the people who are recreating out there are doing so in a respectful manner uh, that minimizes impacts to the water quality, but also that there's an awareness as to the, the, the delicate nature of this uh, resource and, and that we have people using it and conserving it wisely. So the Connected by Water program um, uh, is multifaceted and involves uh, both uh, public education and, and outreach uh, initiatives, but also the development of school curriculum, which has been received extremely well because it's place-based. And so we have the, the, the teachers in the elementary school classrooms who received the initial curriculum, um, sharing that with their students, uh, and uh, you know, beginning with the legend of, of Quiniche, um, uh, that, that talks about the origin story for uh, the Comox First Nation and uh, carrying right through to uh, the scientific uh, aspect of the aquifer and, and how the, the, the water cycle works. And, um, but with, with all the, the resources and information are specific to, to Comox Lake and the, and the watershed there. So that received such excellent feedback that there was a real demand also to expand that to the high school curriculum. So we've, we've just completed um, the initial round of, of drafting that out as well. That's, that's pretty exciting. That's um, that's one way to, uh, by educating the community and, and providing information and resources and better understanding and bringing people out into the resource, that we can improve our, our um, stewardship of, of the resource itself as well as um, manage our, our demand side as well. I think uh, building on what, what Zoe has said, um, we do have some, some great resources and programming available for the Comox Lake watershed. Uh, we also have uh, a liquid waste planning function for our rural areas that allows us to, um, to progress some of our rainwater management planning initiatives. Uh, but that said, what we don't have is a, a broader watershed planning function, uh, a regional watershed planning function. And, um, and so that leaves us relying a lot on, on grant funding opportunities to initiate some of the other watershed planning work in, in some of our other priority areas. And so I think now we're, we're really looking towards 
the RDN and the Cowichan Valley Regional District that have those functions to, to learn from them and, um, and to learn some of the values that those functions provide and, and see where that may lead us. That's a great cue to uh, you two around the importance of, of leadership and foundational leadership with some of your projects and, and new innovative ideas. So talk a little bit about what Derry said about the Comox Valley looking to some of the work that has been going on elsewhere mm -hmm. in terms of these visions and, and foundational leadership. Yeah, that's a great segue. I think, you know, we're using a lot of local government terminology around programs and projects and functions and I'm going to throw in service in there as well but if you think of it this way it's like it starts out with a vision and the community says we want to protect our drinking water our watersheds you know we value the natural environment how can we get that vision to be implemented what do we need to do on the ground you know to basically enable water sustainability and so from a vision, you might have a specific project and that project might get launched and really address one, one key thing. And you check that off and say, that was a really great project. But if that project isn't then uh, embedded within a larger program, which has a longer term scope, which has more resources available to it to be implemented over time, then at just the project level, you know, things could drop off. You could lose momentum after one great project. So what we've done at the Regional District of Nanaimo, and this is, goes back to uh, the, the early 2000s, was you know, in order to implement a vision of water sustainability, we needed to have a function or a service, so a, a parcel tax funded service, that was in place in order to resource implementing an action plan for drinking water and watershed protection. So you develop the vision, you develop a tangible action plan, that it's like a suite of actions that we have for our program. But we have that embedded in a function or in a service that actually collects the, the requisitions or the dollars and the funds that are needed to then go ahead and implement. So that I think is a little bit of like the trajectory of moving from vision to action. You have to have the vision, you have to have the long-term goals, you have to have tangible projects and programs to embed that within. But then the action part is resourcing it, staffing it, building those partnerships that we talked about earlier. And I'm proud to say we're going into the second decade of our drinking water and watershed protection service uh, and have a new 10-year action plan that lays the map for us moving forward. Mm. And I, I think we were probably at the same place as the RDN was ab about 10 years ago when, when they started their, their program up. Uh, within the Cowichan, we were really different situation environment. The, the driving issue at that time was water sustainability on the Cowichan system, fisheries, uh, Cowichan tribes interest, uh, the long-term projections about catalyst and whether they would continue to operate uh, the weir to meet uh, ecological needs within the area. And so the focus was very much on the Cowichan and fisheries. And, and it, at that time, as a region, there was a decision that the taxpayer shouldn't really pay for those things, that those were places where we could be best positioned to provide uh, lobbying or technical support to the, to the kind of the process and the programs. And so our focus then was on the creation of the, the Cowichan Basin Water Management Plan as a, as a, a project, if you will, with external funding, uh, some staff time and resources, but ex largely external funding. And over the last 10 years, the, the issues have popped up all over the place, and, and we've very much been in a situation where we've had to respond by spending a lot of time going after grant funding or leveraging resources or bringing partners together. And, um, you know, it's effective, it moves forward, but then you have communities that uh, are winners, that get the support they need, and you have communities that don't. And, and last year, we were very lucky to have approved at referendum a, a regional function. So the first time that legally, as a regional district, we are able to um, uh, tax and provide services. You can't do that without a referendum or an approval of the electorate. And so we received that last year, and we're, we're now launching into our first 10-year uh, strategy, which is much more comprehensive. We're not having to chase funding. 
which which is great to receive. I don't I don't ever want to uh, say that that's not incredibly helpful, but sometimes it isn't the the highest priority need. It's not the sexiest project that you uh, that you really need to push forward. Or I should say it's it's. It's usually the sexy projects that get it, not necessarily the ones that you really need the core data for. So uh, with this new program, we are going to start the kind of the institutional components of a regional process that makes sure that we are focusing on the highest risk first while collecting data for the rest of the region. Um, Jody, the CRD had a vision for their watersheds, and say in particular Boker Creek. So it's a longer term vision, but through a lot of your work, you've made it actionable. Lots of things have been done to reach that vision. Uh, maybe have you comment a little bit about how important adaptive management is to say the Boker Creek plan to ensure that every little step that you make continues to do what you want it to do is resilient and, and meets your, the, the goals of the vision? So um, we, developed, we developed the uh, vision for the watershed, which was essentially to return the hydrological function and to have people connected back to the, the creek, because at one point a lot of the creek was actually in, in fences or was in pipes. Um, so within the within the blueprint there are i think i don't know 40 watershed wide actions and then each of the 17 reaches have a series of actions specific to that reach so when we were taking that forward to council we realized councils we realized that it was really going to be hard for all three municipalities to try and focus efforts on, on similar actions to move uh, the plan forward for the entire watershed as opposed to just that portion of the municipality within that watershed. So um, a couple of things that we did to, to ensure that that would happen. One, we defined 10 top uh, short-term actions that we all wanted to work towards in the first five to ten years of implementation. Uh, that has been really critical because it's allowed us to really kind of focus on some things. Some of the big actions were ensuring that all of the official community plans of the municipalities reflected uh, some of the principles and um, actions really within the blueprint so that so once it's in the official community plan, that is then what guides and drives the decision making uh, within, the, within the municipalities. And speaking of decision making, having a vision and having a plan that's actually been endorsed by the municipalities is so critical because when decisions are being made, we had an instance where uh, there was a large piece of open property that was actually a community park. Uh, there was an interest to develop a, a large tennis court on this park and um, the community wasn't really on board with that. And it was the blueprint, because we had identified that piece of property within the Boca Creek blueprint as one of the only properties where we had the ability to have a large uh, rainwater storage so that we could re reduce downstream flooding. And the council of the day uh, made the in my opinion, very good decision where they said, you know, it's more important for us to reserve this property for rainwater storage to achieve the vision that we have here in the blueprint than it is uh, for a recreational opportunity. And that recreational opportunity was moved to a different location. Um, so by having the vision, it allowed the council um, to be able to make that decision. Visions, leadership, uh, putting your plans into action. And we've heard a lot about how we're taking the knowledge of our community, how we've been reaching a breakthrough uh, to establish a, a source of funding that's going to keep our projects going. Adaptive management, the importance of uh, buy-in from various jurisdictions with what we're doing. 
So I think the, all the work we've talked about so far has, has really highlighted the importance of the three things, how climate change has led to collaboration, which has led to the development of these visions and projects that um, all of you have been successful in. The next part of the program, I think we're going to just throw it wide open and we're going to let you talk and speak with what's on your mind. So we've heard from four regional districts on a whole range of really innovative and wonderful projects on watershed management, watershed protection. We're going to uh, give each of them a moment to just wrap things up. And I think maybe Jody will start with the capital regional district as say the most urbanized regional district. Uh, give us your thoughts and what you might want to uh, leave the audience with today. Well, it's really hard to get watershed function back into a completely developed area. So what, I, what we're having to do now is we're really trying to figure out how do we re-engineer nature and hydrological function back into our landscape. And when I hear uh, you from the other regional districts on Vancouver Island talking, you're always talking about rural lands and you know large tracts and you actually still have creeks that aren't in pipes. Um, so I guess, I guess what I would want to, to leave you guys with is you have an amazing opportunity to, to put protections in place to actually protect the creeks and, and hopefully even a bit of a riparian buffer before you've developed it all out. You'll, I, I think that that puts you in a position to be able to adapt to climate change in a much more um, robust and resilient way. Uh, down in our region, we're already a rain on rain system and it's gonna get more rainier. So we are having to totally change the land ethic and try and think about how can we store water on the land all over the place in small bits because we don't have large areas where we can put a massive uh, rainwater management facility in place. Um, so look at your natural assets, protect them first, develop around, not the other way around. It's always easy to look forward and say, oh, it's, it, you know, it's hard work, They're, you know, we're not making any difference, but when you look back, um, it suddenly changes everything. And, and I remember when I started at the regional district in, in 2006, um, I came to work as a planner. And uh, the whole issue of environmental protection and watershed management was something that was foreign to the organization. And so now I look at it and say, you know, we've, we've, we've done a phenomenal amount of work uh, since 2006 to where we are right now. We've got uh, programs in place, we've built relationships, we've got foundational science, uh, we've animated our communities, and last year with the, with the successful referendum, we actually have our communities starting to say to us, we want you to use science to inform land use planning. We want you to make better land use decisions based on key information, not just whether it's a beautiful landscape or a viewscape, but we, we want sustainable communities and we want you to do that. And so uh, I'm incredibly encouraged and excited about the fact that we now have a functional program moving forward uh, that allows us to build on those, those visions for the community. And I don't know where we're going. I mean, we have a, a strategy and a plan but it's going to change over time. So uh, to me, that's incredibly exciting. And I'm hoping that uh, we continue our relationship, but, uh, but also that we continue to invite the community to be part of that process with us. So. I think it's, it's great to, to look back, Kate, as well, because you know, I, I think we have also made some, some great strides in implementing our rural area rainwater management plan and improving um, the way that uh, we manage rainwater in terms of our land development process. And we are in a unique opportunity where um, we do have some very rural communities that, that are quickly developing, but they are still very rural. And, um, and it is an opportunity to get things right at the front end and, and really uh, develop those communities with a, a water-centric vision and, um, and create some resilient communities that are 
able to adapt to our changing climate. Yeah, I think um, there there's a lot to be um, said for what we have accomplished, um, and I attribute that uh, to the amazing collaboration that has taken place, not only within our community but also um, outside of our community, and it and it brings to mind um, the the. Uh, what we were referring to early, earlier about uh, about water and water not recognizing political boundaries and and creeks flowing from w one jurisdiction through another. Um, so, um, you know, along that that thread, uh, uh, I'm feeling very grateful for having these opportunities to learn from our communities um, on the neighbor on, on in the neighboring jurisdictions and on Vancouver Island and. Hopefully, as as Jody mentioned, um, uh, address issues from the front end, especially with how quickly things are changing um, with, with climate change. In addition, in our community, there's been so much. Um, there's a tremendous, tremendous amount of growth uh, in the community, and and things are are growing so rapidly as people are moving here from other parts of of the province and uh, elsewhere in the world. So um, we need to try to manage that in addition to uh, the changes that we're seeing. Um, so yeah, we have a great opportunity to do that right now. Well, you know, of course, we're all regional district. Uh, we represent that local level of government that's simultaneously close to the resource, but also at the same time closer to some of the regulatory and senior government agencies where we can, you know, collectively advocate for things that are outside our areas of authority. And so while we might have different geographies, you know, uh, more urban areas or more rural areas, you know, what we have in common is we're close to the resource and we care about water. And I think, you know, starting from a foundation of awareness within our communities and the role that we have at the regional district level to raise that awareness, engage our communities, um, and not only from an outreach and education standpoint, but also then what we've talked a lot about today is from data collection, the science, like actually having you know, quantifiable information that will lead into our decision-making processes. And the key decision that, if I could distill what we've been talking about, is deciding you know, how to develop our land in a way that is very centered on managing and protecting water. And climate change and what it is, you know, it's, it's a big challenge, but really when you kind of get past the complexity, there's the simplicity of protecting our land protects our water. And if we can sort of work both at the community level, the government level, um, to, to look at how we can preserve the natural function, even as simple as soil, the vegetation, and how can we have more engaging processes at the community level um, and, and further. Um, I think that's really kind of a big takeaway of our, our discussion here today. And planting the seeds so that our collaboration goes further, beyond just talking at uh, the stakeholder level, uh, but engaging at the rights holder level with First Nations who have a unique relationship with land and water uh, in their traditional territories. And that's, I think, a jumping off point for us to continue this conversation. Today we heard about local government water stewardship initiatives and the growing networks of collaboration between regional districts and stewardship organizations. Next week we will learn about some tools to help our cities and regions understand and value healthy functioning watersheds and to understand this in terms of asset management and the resources required to sustain these ecological services. Looking ahead to the second and third modules in the series Paul and I ask you to reflect on two quotable quotes that distill the essence of actionable visions to improve where we live. The first quote is by Eric Bonham, one of the founders of the Partnership for Water Sustainability. Eric wrote, when the combination of citizen talent is aligned with a local government that is both visionary and focused, outstanding achievements are not only possible, but realistic. The second quote dates back to 1786 and is written on a gravestone in an English churchyard. It reads, A vision without a task is but a dream. A task without a vision is but drudgery. A vision with a task is the hope of the world.
since 2011 with over 14 different stewardship groups. And what that does is it sort of enables this inclusivity, this participation within the data collection. And that information is then input into provincial databases and it's analyzed to really point out, okay, where do we need to prioritize actions in terms of potentially it could be restoration. So restoring riparian areas, revegetating stream banks, or working with municipal drainage engineers to point out where stormwater management design could help mitigate some of the sedimentation and erosion that's happening, you know, coming from stormwater systems. So I think, you know, yes, there's legacy challenges from historic development, but we can address that with current development practices that are being improved. But the bridge between the historic and current is the data, the information to know where the problems are. And then the other bridge is the community. So the participation uh, of many groups in, in order to solve those challenges in front of us. So I hope that provides a little bit of an example and Happy to hear from others too. So how about you, Derry? And then we'll hear from Zoe on some of the challenges you're finding in, in the work that you're doing and getting to your goal. Sorry. Um, yeah, I just have to, to echo some of what Julie said. I mean, I think um, data and is really important in making those science-based decisions in, in our land use planning and, and decisions that we're making. And um, building that that database of, of knowledge is is certainly a challenge but but one that I think uh, the RDN has really um, approached in a, in a really collaborative and um, an important way in engaging the stewardship sector and I think that's something that um, that we're looking to towards in the future as, as a model for us to build on um, also I think in in um, engaging our communities and engaging our residents and really building that knowledge and understanding within our communities on kind of the impacts made at a, at a local kind of um, level on, on people's property, on their land, on the land that they manage and, um, and really allowing people to, to understand and to manage their land in a more sustainable and water centric way. Zoe? To understand and to manage their land in a more sustainable and water centric way. I'm having a really um, challenging feedback uh, delayed double um, audio going on, but I'm going to try to hopefully um, you won't be hearing what I'm hearing. Audio going on, but is my audio okay? So maybe closing the YouTube video would be the oh, way to solve that. Yeah, let me, let me try that. Is my audio okay? Okay, that's much better. Thanks, Julie. Um, so we do have, uh, I, I guess, um, we have a lot of similar issues across all of the regions on the island. And um, I, I could echo a lot of what um, Julie and, and Derry have said. But I think one thing that I could add in terms of challenges um, is that is uh, in the Comox Valley Regional District, we don't really have uh, dedicated funding for a lot of water stewardship and sustainability um, uh, other apart from certain areas. Uh, for instance, we have dedicated funding um, for the Comox Lake watershed, but we have so many other watersheds in our regional district uh, that have not got funding and where uh, efforts to um, for stewardship and management are being uh, completely spearheaded by volunteer groups. So I think uh, dedicated funding source for us for our water management issues, both surface water and groundwater uh, would be an, an ongoing challenge. So uh, Jody, um, well, let's hear from you next. Again, working in such an urbanized environment, I'm, I'm curious to see whether some of the challenges you're facing are similar or different than what we've heard so far. Hi. Um, a lot of the challenges are similar. We are in a much more urbanized environment. And as I was saying in the video, we're a rain on rain system. Uh, with our, our climate projections as they are, our expectation is that we're going to get a lot more rainfall. 
so there is going to be um, an increased potential for flooding and property damage. Um, so one of the things that uh, all of the municipalities in the region um, hopefully will be able to work together on is looking at changing that land use um, and redevelopment so that we're um, incorporating a whole lot more green infrastructure and um, ensuring that our uh, what's left of our ecological assets are protected so that over time uh, we can kind of reverse the trend of, of hydrology that we have here in the region or lack of functioning hydrology I should say. Kate, Kate. Um, maybe the example that I'll, I'll give is um, the, the work that we did with regards to Stoltz Slide uh, remediation. Um, and so a lot of the communities had been putting a phenomenal amount of effort into restoration of side channels, rebuilding function uh, in the lower end of the system or in various tributaries. However, uh, with the Stoltz Slide, uh, basically, the Cowichan River is cutting into or was cutting into an eroding clay bank. And what we were finding was that we were getting roughly 80% fishery survival above the slide and less than 10% below the slide, which is enormous. And so the community is putting a phenomenal amount of energy into something that really needs a systems fix. And I think the example there really showcases um, how we can work across uh, organizations and jurisdictions to really deal with a massive problem. So it was the largest in-river restoration project in Canada uh, where everybody came together. Nobody had funding for this. It was no individual organization's responsibility uh, to address this. Uh, it was within BC Parks who have a philosophy of letting, um, you know, nature do what it will. And so through this process, um, everybody sort of put their, their, their time, their energy, their limited resources, their leveraged resources into uh, effectively moving the river away from the, the toe of the slope itself undertaking a massive uh, uh, stabilization project and then putting the river back. And so uh, from, a, from a community perspective, below the river on the, on the cap or below the slide, which is basically three quarters of the way up the river, everything flowed gray all year round and, and even worse in, in a high flow situation to having the river flow clear. And that had phenomenal benefits in terms of how the community saw and identified with the river to see something that's clear and blue and you can see the fish, you wanna go swimming in it uh, to not just dealing with the fisheries issue and a kind of an unraveling of a historic uh, logging or land use uh, kind of uh, challenge to having something that people treasured in a completely different way. It also really showcased the power of unity across organizations to deal with a really big problem. So that, that sort of wicked issue of how do we move forward? And I think it's a foundational piece to uh, the notion that it isn't one individual organization, but we all take responsibility for meeting those objectives. So I think that would be my local example of, of how the cross-jurisdictional or cross-organizational uh, work has very substantial benefits. We can't hear you, Richard. It's like you're on mute there, Richard. Rats. I, I really promised myself I wasn't going to do that. Um, so Kate, we're, we'll hear from you first next. We've had a lot of people talk about education plans, 10 year plans, um, what do you see as your, your important projects going forward? Um, building on sort of the last theme around specific challenges, what I'd like to do is, is that I'd like to ask you, starting with you, Kate, and then Jody, um, has reconciliation 
developed or promoted any kind of new ideas for you and your programs around things you might want to do or programs that are projects that you had now considering that reconciliation has now allowed you to look at things slightly differently? Um, I, I think maybe our area is a little bit different than most in that uh, working with and um, in partnership with the with Cowichan tribes has really been a core component of, of our work to date. And so I think the the whole framing around reconciliation strengthens that work, strengthens our ability to communicate the, the importance of that. Um, and I think it also allows us to really look at the opportunities within the, the new Water Sustainability Act to be able to say, how do we, um, how do we look forward and at the same time look backwards to say, what, what is it that we're trying to achieve? What's the base functionality we're trying to achieve? Not just maintain current function, but to rebuild function and, and what does that baseline look like? And so that informs everything from uh, our sediment management plans. Do we just manage sediment to uh, protect the viability of the diking system or are we managing sediment to try and recreate a pre-colonial um, uh, impact to the river itself and fisheries. Um, I think it also informs uh, some of the work that we're exploring right now with regards to uh, long-term management of uh, water infrastructure on the Cowichan system and whether or not uh, Cowichan tribes is uh, or could conceivably be interested in taking a very a dominant leadership approach as a government entity around management of that system as opposed to a participant in the process itself. And so I think that's, that's found fundamental. Um, the other issue is out of our 10 year strategy, we're sort of looking at it in three, three blocks in the first three to five years, really focusing on science and data acquisition uh, in order to establish uh, objectives and in conversation with not just Cowichan, but the other First Nations in our region, uh, you know, expanding from the kind of the provincial water quality objectives to really incorporate traditional knowledge into water quality objectives around other values that aren't typically uh, incorporated in, in basic, you know, pH or, or other types of um, uh, chemical or physical characteristics, but the character of water in a very different way. So I think it's it's been fundamental in terms of how we're approaching uh, our 10-year strategy and our relationship with our communities. Great. Jody, anything to add? Yeah, I think that there's a lot of opportunities uh, with reconciliation. As Kate was saying, um, looking at that traditional or understanding the traditional knowledge um, and, and uh, having the elders tell us about what used to be there, often that can help us to identify what our restoration goals may be for a specific area. Um, our, the CRD board uh, in, our, in our board priorities they've actually designated First Nations reconciliation as, as one of the top priorities here at the CRD. Uh, so there's a lot of activity happening around that. Uh, one of the things that um, is just being considered by the board right now is uh, the ability for uh, First Nations leaders around the region to be able to participate in some of the uh, board committees um, and potentially some of the commissions. Um, I think legally right now they can't sit um, as uh, on the regional board, but they were looking at how can we incorporate or um, enable them to have input through a lot of the different committees. We're also, um, water is one of those things that connects us all. And um, I think most of us are fairly aware that, that um, water and, and fish are very key uh, and important resources uh, for our local, our local nations here. So as we're, uh, as we're going through and looking at things like developing regional biodiversity strategies and regional integrated watershed management strategies, 
um, the ability to engage and have uh, really meaningful discussions with First Nations about what that looks like for them, um, I, th I think will take us a lot closer to uh, helping to ensure that reconciliation takes place. A big part of reconciliation is simply understanding. And, and again, the region has uh, put a fairly significant effort towards um, improving the understanding, uh, improving the government to government relationship and conversations that are happening between uh, our elected officials and First Nations um, officials and leadership. And then on the ground, um, we're hoping that we will have opportunities once once that higher level relationship is worked out, uh, then we'll have opportunities to work directly with uh, many of the nations in, in a lot of the different watersheds that we're working in. A lot of our nations have also identified some significant areas that um, it's very important for them to be able to see the herring resources coming back and the very fishing resources coming back. So I'm, I'm hopeful that we'll be able to have a number of projects where we can work directly with First Nations on that. And then we can also work with our stewardship community and of course, all of the local government partners uh, along with First Nations to, to see how we can actually try and restore some of those areas so that not a, the whole community is getting the, those natural assets back. Uh, anything to add from the other three? Hi, this is Zoe. Um, yeah, um, we in uh, 2018, the Comox First Nation and the Comox Valley Regional District signed a mutual benefit agreement confirming the cooperation and collaboration in um, the management of water resources in our region. So that was a really important milestone towards building a meaningful relationship and partnership between the KFN and CBRD and has, um, I think, also been the launching, launching point for other similar types of cooperation in other aspects um, in other areas of the CBRD. But the plan, um, it, the, in, in the signing of the agreement, um, KFN was uh, supporting the Comox Valley Water Treatment Project and the Comox Valley's water license application. And um, the plan also includes uh, the extension of future water services to Comox lands in the south um, and greater participation by KFN in the management of regional water resources. Um, but I think, you know, importantly, the agreement recognizes that water is a shared uh, interest between the Comox First Nation and the Comox Valley Regional District. And um, the agreement provides a framework for how we will all work together uh, now, but also in the future to ensure that water resources are managed and protected. And also, uh, in recent years, we have established a more formal procedure by which we are able to um, obtain input and involvement from KFN, uh, the Comox First Nation at the earliest conceptual stages of all of our projects throughout all of the services of the Comox Valley Regional District and then maintaining that involvement through all the stages of our projects. So I think this has been a tremendous benefit for, for all of us. Um, and uh, yeah, and then on the ground, uh, also we are having, uh, we've had assistance with the Comox Guardian Watchmen as well. So um, yeah, I'd, I'd say that that um, we have been able to incorporate uh, Indigenous perspectives in the work that we're doing at a far greater level than we were even three or four years ago. And um, and yeah, it's, it's, it's definitely encouraging. And uh, I would say that the relationship here is becoming much stronger and healthier. It's great to hear from the other regional districts about some of these formal uh, working relationships and, and protocol agreements that are in place um, between the, the regional governments and, and the local First Nations. I understand that those are under development and, and there are some that exist within our region as well, but it's still in, in its infancy in terms of developing a, a formal process uh, for engaging with First Nations on sort of the water governance and watershed management uh, side of things. 
but I will kind of comment that, you know, the First Nations within our region, within all of our regions, um, are essentially the, the original stewards of the land and waters since time immemorial. So, you know, we're, we're really keen on, on promoting stewardship of our water resources locally, uh, but we need to remember there's that unique role of, of the First Nations from a cultural perspective. And I think hopefully it'll be a combination of coming up with these sort of formal working agreements of, you know, how at a government to government level, this can happen at the local and regional levels, but also at the provincial levels, right? Because the province is, is the one who's handing out water licenses and adjudicating those decisions on who gets how much water uh, within the different water uses that are non-domestic, right? So I think, you know, at the local and regional level, one role we can play, and we have played at, at the RDN is, is, you know, with those formal agreements aside, and they're in process at higher levels, on the ground at sort of the project level, we've been able to work with local uh, First Nations, for example, the Qualcomm First Nation, um, to get advice on, on our monitoring programs, to say, you know, if we were to establish, um, you know, monitoring site on the big Qualcomm River, you know, where would you suggest that we, we do that? And we actually, you know, walked up the river with, the, with Chief Rakalma and he helped to sort of point out, okay, here would be some locations that would be, you know, of interest to collect data and talked a little bit about, you know, the historic nature of these sites on the river. Um, and then from a groundwater perspective too, same thing. It's like uh, working with Chief Rakalma at the Qualcomm First Nation, again, on that project level, um, to, to locate some groundwater monitoring wells that uh, were sort of these abandoned wells on reserve that we've now equipped with groundwater monitoring loggers and that information is going into databases. And so I think it's good to keep in mind, yeah, yes, there's these formal agreements that need to take place and it's great to have those established, but we can also have these on the ground, um, you know, working partnerships at the project level that help to build trust and build relationships as the formal structures come into place at, at higher levels too. Okay, we want to add anything, Derry, or uh, shall I go on to uh, a couple of more questions from our audience and start with you? Um, yeah, maybe start with me next. I, I think Zoe provided a pretty comprehensive overview from our perspective. Okay. Um, I know the, the Partnership for Water Sustainability recognized the importance of, of weaving that Indigenous knowledge and cultural history with our watersheds into, you know, almost every kind of watershed plan. And so it's it's really important that we think of that cultural knowledge, especially with uh, the youth of today. Um, I was really touched, Jody, with your story from the video about growing up in Saskatchewan and spending your days in with your gumboots and, and wandering around and catching frogs. And I think those kinds of opportunities are rare for our, our youth and, and, and people, and they're losing that connection with the land. And that's where I think the, the importance of this Indigenous knowledge is is so crucial to moving forward. So uh, this next question, again, we'll start with you, Derry, and then we'll go sort of backwards again uh, with Julie next. This is, a, this is a good question. It's, a, it's gonna really kind of, the little foreshadowing with some of the new sessions that are on the way, but um, we've had a question here is, is that is your uh, organization contemplating investment in any kind of infrastructure whose primary focus is the delivery of some kind of natural natural service or natural system function. Um, yeah, so I think, I think I mentioned in the video um, our electoral area rainwater management strategy. And really, I think what we're trying to do um, through the implementation of some of the objectives and action items identified there is is to um, one, protect our natural resources, protect our riparian areas, um, but also to, to build more, more green infrastructure to kind of build that um, natural hydrologic function back into our, our watersheds, back into our neighborhoods and, um, and kind of in, improve the way that we, we develop our land. Yeah, and we'll be looking to the Comox Valley Regional District um, and the work that they've done and that Dairy's done um, in terms of rainwater management. Is that something that um, 
in the regional district of Nanaimo, we have on the books to proceed with a regional rainwater management strategy um, starting in 2021. And that would be, of course, in partnership with the municipalities in the region who have their own stormwater drainage systems, but then also in the rural areas, it's Ministry of Transportation and Infrastructure uh, that deals with the rural road drainage. So I think at the regional level, coordinating, you know, what does that look like for managing um, the natural assets that are our creeks and streams from a rainwater management perspective, in the sense that, you know, all the runoff from roadways and any impervious surfaces uh, is essentially, you know, going towards our creeks and streams and then out into the ocean. And that is crossing jurisdictional boundaries. So we're going to really be looking to Comox Valley and some of the work that Dairy's done at that regional level. Um, from a rainwater management perspective. I will point to one project we have ongoing this year with the Partnership for Water Sustainability BC, um, which is looking at the ecological accounting process um, for kind of quantifying the, the financial worth or value of the Millstone River corridor, which flows through electoral area C into the city of Nanaimo. And, and the riparian areas alongside the river channel itself. And so there's a process by which to kind of calculate uh, the value of that stream corridor and the riparian areas. Um, and we're going through that right now. And we're hoping that sort of the outcomes of that study and that calculation will give a little bit of um, insight as to, you know, creating a budget line item within local government um, finances. So city of Nanaimo, as well as RDN, to attribute to the value that the Millstone River and its riparian areas providing to the community. Because right now, you know, there's BC assessment values for all the properties within that watershed, except for the stream itself, right? And so the kind of concept there is, you know, we work at you know, the municipal level and regional government level off of budget line items. And if we can say quantify some sort of proxy value for what that river is providing in terms of ecological services, then that can be something we can invest in at the local level to have you know, clearly marked funds for the restoration, remediation, enhancement, and even incentivizing private landowners to go above and beyond and protecting some of that riparian area as well. So that's new territory for us. We haven't really uh, gone down that path of ecological accounting or natural asset accounting. So this will be an interesting pilot for us. And I know some of our other regional partners have gone through this process. So again, this is an example of where we can work together across regions to test and experiment with some new um, processes with the ultimate goal of protecting the ecological and hydrological function uh, within our region's water resources. So I'll share that. Uh, thanks, Julie. Um, for the members that are tuning in online, uh, Julie mentioned the uh, project they're working on on the using the ecological accounting process. Uh, I want to remind the viewers that that process is going to be the subject of one of the um, uh, future series coming up. So if you're really interested in le learning more about this, make sure you uh, get a hold of that. Um, let's go to, to you, Jody. How about some things that you and your program might be contemplating where the primary goal is is some kind of natural systems uh, resource benefit. Yeah, there's there's actually a fair a fair number. Um, one of the things that we've done as a region, we worked with the local governments um, and we got some assistance from Metro Vancouver as well. And we've actually developed um, a set of design guidelines for green infrastructure that is available uh, for use by all of the municipalities. Um, so I think that's a really good resource and that, that um, helps to enable the municipalities to ensure that more natural type of infrastructure that's going to um, improve our hydrological functioning in our watersheds uh, is going to be built. Um, we've also just built a new sewage treatment plant here in the region. And so there's been some low impact development features incorporated into that building, such as a green roof and flow through planters. So um, the building that I'm in right now also has a green roof on it. So um, as we're building new infrastructure, um, there's often either a lead um, desire to, to achieve lead standards or uh, we're starting to see a lot more green infrastructure being incorporated into new builds that, that the region itself is doing. 
Um, and then another area, uh, Elk Beaver Lake is one of the, the most used recreational lakes here in the region, both for swimming, boating, um, and fishing. And um, it's, it's, uh, we have some significant problems with algal blooms that are now starting to occur almost year round in, in some parts of the lake. Uh, due to uh, an incredible amount of nutrients that are that are stuck at the bottom of the lake, as well as ongoing nutrient inputs that are coming into the lake. So the region has um, put forward and we're, we're um, hoping to hear soon from the province regarding funding, uh, where we'll be installing um, a large oxygenation system in that lake so that we can start to deal with some of the nutrient inputs so that we can get uh, improvements in water quality and obviously recreational opportunities at that lake. And then the last one that I'll talk about is um, we're just uh, we're just moving forward on on planning for a regional biodiversity strategy, and we also have board priority um, around developing an ecolog e ecological asset management plan for the region. Uh, so. Both of those projects, I think, are going to be quite closely aligned um, as we're developing the inventories and, and kind of putting together all of the information that we know about biodiversity in the region, which is going to include things like land cover analysis or, or you know, where our trees and various habitat types are, but it's also going to include things like uh, the water courses, our wetlands, where our fisheries resources and all of those things are. Um, so, so that will actually form kind of the, the basis for an ecological asset management plan in terms of looking at the regional ecological assets and then uh, we'll be able to work with municipalities, First Nations, community groups and others uh, to try and ensure that we're protecting some of those key ecological resources that we still have left in our region. Great. Uh, thanks, Jody. Um, I'm gonna, I'm conscious as we're approaching noon here and we don't wanna keep everyone uh, too long, but I've had a number of questions around policy and policy as a tool to further our watershed protection goals. So uh, I'm gonna start with you, Kate, and I'd like to talk, have you just briefly answer the question around what kinds of policy are you interested in and how do you think it's gonna help you further your watershed stewardship goals. Thanks, Richard. Um, I think uh, at kind of two levels, uh, one of the really clear messages we got from the community was, you know, science informed land use planning. And so we'll be uh, starting to work on providing uh, sort of modernized uh, recommendations, if you will, with regards to land use decision making, primarily around uh, new development or redevelopment. So everything from uh, proof of water, uh, specific uh, parameters uh, related to individual aquifers or individual watersheds, as opposed to kind of a, a, a straight across the board. So it's more nuanced at the community level. Uh, and then there's a really clear linkage back to rationale and, and carrying capacity. Uh, so that's kind of at the, the land use planning level. Uh, it also relates to our level of service and infrastructure within our uh, delivery systems. So from an asset management point of view, uh, policies related to uh, climate proofing our, our utilities and climate proofing our facilities. And then also at maybe the third level is really around uh, working and continuing to work with our provincial partners around enhancing and opening some of the existing uh, guidance documents or regulatory uh, documents related to how we as local government uh, manage within our area. So that's everything from the Private Managed Forest Land uh, Act and how it, how it relates to our communities. Uh, obviously working in strong partnership with those 
uh, rights holders in terms of the large forestry companies to be able to transition from, you know, your work on that side of the juris or not jurisdictional line, but property line to this side, but to have larger policy language and objectives, joint objectives regarding water qu quality and water supply, particularly as it relates to our communities. It will always be very challenging uh, to, to move towards uh, limits to growth, but obviously we want that uh, long-term conversation around balancing limits to growth versus servicing and uh, enhanced requirements in particular areas where we've already surpassed the existing uh, carrying capacity, uh, in particular for some of our aquifers. So I think that's kind of where we're going. Uh, thanks, Kate. Um... So I'm going to try to wrap things up here. I've got one more question that I'm going to put forward to both Zoe and Derry, and then we can have some input from uh, the rest of the panel if you uh, if you'd like. We've had a number of questions around uh, recreation, balancing recreational pressure on our environmentally sensitive areas with the need for people to connect with the land. Um, learn and understand what it means like to be in and around uh, natural healthy ecosystems. So if the two of you could maybe take a turn each and talk about how your work and watershed plans strive to balance the issues with recreation and watershed protection. Thanks, Richard. Um, yeah, I think fundamentally, um, I'm going to try to keep this brief, but given that it's already noon, but fundamentally, uh, it, it's, it is like you say, it's a bit of a paradox because you, we, we, we want to get people into the resource so that they can uh, understand how valuable it is and how delicate and fragile it is. But um, at the same time, we need to balance that with the actual protection of the resource itself. Fundamentally, I think what it comes down to is um, the strength of our education and outreach programs so that we can, um, we can double up in terms of providing people with a, a you know, fundamental understanding of, of why and, and how these resources are um, in need of protection and, and how, what we can do, what actions we can take that will help that um, with, the, the fact that um, people who haven't, who, who aren't out there aren't understanding uh, what, what it is that we are trying to accomplish. So um, yeah, I think as long as our, our plans are, are recognizing the actual, um, you know, that, um, that, that we are providing people with the information that they need before they go out there um, with the, the behaviors that that we're trying to encourage while they are out there, um, that that it's it's possible in our community anyway, and I'm not saying this is the case for all communities, um, that, that we can achieve a balance. Derry? Yeah, I guess just, just quickly um, to kind of echo what, what Zoe said, I, I think a balance is able to be achieved. And I do think that, that environmental education is so important to kind of promoting water stewardship in our community. And um, really, you know, I think if, if we're going to be successful, it's, it's not going to be just us at the government level, it's going to be everybody in our communities um, engaged and understanding and, and involved in, in protecting that resource. So, yeah. Anyone else want to add anything? I want to thank you, Richard, for moderating and keeping us all in an orderly fashion here over Zoom. Thanks so much. Okay. Um, I want to just say that I've been really thankful that I've been allowed the opportunity to, to get together, work with the five of you, uh, the partnership, and uh, all of the other people helping us produce um, produce this session. Uh, like I mentioned, we've got two more coming. We're going to hear on the very innovative ecological accounting process. And then we're also going to hear from some of the provinces and the federal governments, real uh, 
national experts on fish habitat and hydrology and groundwater in, in one of the other upcoming sessions. So I wanna thank all of our, uh, our viewers and um, stay tuned for the, the upcoming series and it's been a real pleasure. So thank you everyone.